now it's time to move into the second and last module, so to speak, of, uh, of this Honor Harlem Initiative Summit. Fantastic morning, I would say. Thank you all for contributing. Hope also you had a chance to mingle during the, the break to build those strong networks that we need more than ever. Um, we talked about the needs, we talked about the threats. Uh, we are in a situation that uh, you can describe bo as both internal big reforms going on inside both Sweden and Finland, inside with NATO, and with Europe, with the third directive that we're going to talk about. And then we also have these powerful forces of change externally with war in Ukraine, the climate crisis, and uh, else that we need to address. But now, focus on one big uh, engine for change, may I say hopefully, is the SIR directive. And we have invited Eero Kuttema, uh, Minister Advisor at the Ministry of Interior here in Finland, to give us a brief about the SIR directive. So, please. Mr. There you are. I couldn't find you. A warm welcome. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, happy to be here. So indeed, I have uh, eight minutes time to explain a rather complicated uh, new directive. So I, I uh, decided to do a sort of academic approach to it. So indeed, uh, this is a completely new approach. It is a, a big change, not only for Finland, Sweden, Norway, but for the for the whole union. So, uh, uh, and we have only less than uh, two years time, basically, to implement the whole thing. So, uh, it's going to be interesting. But of course, from the legal uh, point of view and and the background of whole critical infrastructure uh, protection or resilience issue is is uh, counterterrorism. Uh, it was basically 9/11 in the U.S that, that uh, kick-started uh, the academic discussion and thinking how we should protect our critical infrastructures. And, and the European regulation uh, was, was uh, impacted heavily, the 2004 Madrid uh, suicide uh, terrorist attack in trains and 2005 London attack to the, to the buses. So uh, Commission uh, immediately activated and, and uh, issued a strategy how, to, how Europe should uh, protect its uh, critical infrastructure. And the first sort of legal framework was introduced in, in 2008. Of course, it was a result of, uh, of a negotiation and, and it got, I would say, quite severely ripped down from the original proposal. It had more sectors, but the outcome was basically that it only focused on energy infrastructure and transport infrastructure. And, and it introduced the concept of uh, European critical infrastructure. It, it had to be uh, meaningful for, for several countries. It had to be big in size. And, and basically, all the tools were mainly traditional risk management. So all in all, it wasn't very successful, some countries designated uh, ECIs in their countries, but Finland, for example, didn't. Uh, we every year reported commission that uh, we still do not have any European critical infrastructures. And then um, big change started to happen. You have been uh, talking about resilience for the whole morning and, and uh, co last couple of days. Uh, and, and the same approach now applies to this new, new legal framework. Uh, it's an all-hazard approach, and, and one can always debate uh, about the background of, of uh, sort of uh, concept of resilience in, in critical infrastructure protection, but it basically boils down to the uh, Russian invasion of Crimea, and also uh, the ongoing, uh, ongoing uh, cyber and, and, and also uh, other malign influencing against Europe that basically uh, within the NATO setting, but also European Union setting, member states realized that you know actually we cannot protect critical infrastructure, but we should actually focus on building resilience to our systems. And and there I, in in, in the text I, I basically wrote that you know what does it mean? 
It's the whole crisis management cycle. It's about the absorptive and adaptive capabilities, redundancy, recovery strategies. So this is uh, the, the conceptual thinking behind the new directive. And, and of course, the, one has to say that the Commission did excellent job by introducing a very ambitious directive. Uh, it was much more than we expected. I see some familiar faces here from our EU presidency 2019. We introduced some of the ideas that actually Commission took on board. But uh, it was a very comprehensive proposal, and it has more or less survived the negotiation procedure. Uh, it's, uh, it, it, the logic of the directive is that it, it regulates the member states. It obliges the member state to, to establish uh, functions uh, that, uh, has, that have dialogue with these critical entities that are, are uh, tasked to identify them, but also regulate them. So uh, it was uh, introduced in the late 2020s. And of course, when the war broke out, uh, the Commission took this directive as one of the priority, priority uh, proposals. And, and they have now recently introduced the stress test concept and other things that actually are all built on this, this, this regulation. But it is a very elegant uh, approach. It has the cross-border approach. It has the cross-sectoral approach. Uh, the sectors expanded heavily from, from two sectors to 11 sectors. It's a risk-based approach. Uh, next slide, I will explain in detail what are the sort of the generic obligations to member states and, and to these critical entities. Uh, but it has also sort of support element to how we can help critical entities to develop their resilience. And it has this kind of uh, very solid uh, cooperation mechanism. So these are the sectors. So in the previous legal framework was the two, two, two of those. Now we have space. Uh, it's a big thing, I think, for Sweden and Finland, because we are, we are more or less the only countries in, in, in European Union that have, have uh, uh, these uh, capabilities up north. We have wastewater, drinking water, financial marketing infrastructure, even public administration. So this is the, the broad focus that we need to now uh, focus on and, and look how our present uh, structures in our member states fit to this concept. So these are the main elements. So every member state, they need to develop a, a national framework that in includes a strategy. They need to have a continuous risk assessment process. They need to identify these critical uh, entities and critical operators based on the common criteria. So it's, the idea is, of course, that it's going to be similar uh, across Europe. And then there are, in every member state, there, there, there are, there's going to be a single point of contact. And there is a need for a supervisory and enforcement regime in all the countries, meaning basically that if a, a critical entity uh, doesn't oblige the recommendations on, on how to develop their, their uh, resilience, there are then uh, measures how you can enforce that. But also for critical entities, there is this uh, obligation to do risk assessment in a certain way. It's a very broad recommendation, so there is a lot of uh, tool for maneuver both member states and both, both uh, entities-wise, but it, it has the same framework. So uh, there needs to be an incident notification system. So if there is a disruption, uh, that, that company or entity is obliged to report to the national uh, authority in 24 hours. That's one example. Uh, so this is a, uh, it's, it's gonna be a quite a big undertaking. And then uh, since I only had eight minutes, and, and, and I thought that I need to also throw in some ideas. These are not cleared in our leadership, so these are just my recommendations, but uh, uh, I thought that uh, it would be a good idea to propose them. So thinking of the map and, and, and knowing already our close connections to Sweden and Norway, especially in critical uh, energy infrastructure, but also data, 
it would be a idea, a good idea to to look this implementation phase uh, trilaterally. And also, there 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 is already a quite a good number of work uh, concerning uh, critical dependencies and interdependencies. But I think uh, we should look one more time through the third directive. What are these dependencies and interdependencies between our countries? And also the recent proposal that came from uh, von der Leyen's commission, a five-point plan to do these joint stress tests. We, neither Sweden or Finland or Norway know what, what does it mean. Commission is currently working on these stress tests, but we, we should do them. So one idea would be that perhaps we should uh, combine our forces and look at it together. And also to uh, have a discussion about the shared level of ambition. Is it the same in, in our nations? Finland has actually, uh, our government has, has already stated that uh, we have a high level of ambition to implement this directive. Uh, in, in our uh, government report last spring, had one chapter on critical infrastructure resilience, and it, it basically outlined the implementation plan for us. And, and we will start that work in actually in, in uh, the next few weeks. So. I would like to close with this slide. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much of the sir, uh, directive that we have also been talking about in the Hon Holman initiatives, important and the catalyst for more cooperation also. So now I'm glad to uh, invite uh, Carl Allestet uh, to the stage, uh, participant on the first ever Hon Holman initiative last year. Now the senior analyst at the Swedish Defense Research Agency, and you're going to talk about, give us a little bit of flavor of the a more holistic thinking regarding total defense. Warm welcome. Okay. Thank you. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, and thinking of the course last year, I mean, the focus was on crisis preparedness. And this year, of course, a major crisis is actually here uh, upon us. But I'm actually not going to focus on, on that particular crisis. I will use the minutes I have to focus on another time perspective than usual when talking about crisis preparedness. Also, just to be clear, everything I say here today is in my personal capacity and in no way represents the views of the Swedish Defense Research Agency. What constitutes a crisis could be all sorts of things, from natural disasters to terror attacks, pandemics, or being subjected to a special military operation. But a common problem is that humans react strongly to crises when they occur, but frequently neglect the crisis preparedness work that could have prevented or mitigated the effects of the crisis. But my point today is not to stand here complaining that most countries have not been perfect at long-term crisis preparedness, because we knew that already. My message today is that the framing of crisis preparedness probably needs to be broadened beyond what most people might even call crisis preparedness. One area today where long-term approach is beginning to take shape concerns climate change. The Cold War is a historic example of collective Western action over several decades. Short-term interests were sacrificed for the overarching strategic goal of countering global communism, and it worked. To be able to survive over time, we need to counter threats over different time perspectives. We need to be able to handle the acute problems facing us right now, but we also need to be able to handle the threats that will manifest in the future, including very far away in time. If we look over the long run of history, we see a correlation between economic and military power in total terms. But economics also matter in terms of military power on a more granular level. Data from hundreds of battles has shown that the more economically developed sides in conflicts 
consistently outfight the poorer sides on a soldier-for-soldier -soldier basis. Economic strength becomes a key part, if not the key part, of our security over time. This has two important implications. Firstly, in order to maximize our security, we need to maximize our economic potential. Secondly, for small countries, joining coalitions is the only way to counter larger powers. What is really critical to understand is that what is not security is security over time. Education policy, effective governance, infrastructure investments, research and development, free trade with friendly states, all these things and many more non-security policy areas are critical to boost our economic growth and maximize our economic base. And this is key to our long-term survival. Let me explain. From a long-term perspective, we face several threats. The climate threat, the threat of democracies failing due to increased internal polarization, unexpected natural catastrophes, and more. But the military threat posed by other states remains critical in the long run. This military threat is especially problematic due to rapid scientific developments. What will happen if a state develops powerful artificial general intelligence ahead of other states or other key scientific breakthroughs? Those developing a key technology first could potentially achieve a scientific and technological lead over their competitors, which could translate into military superiority. The recently announced US restrictions on providing advanced semiconductors to China have the expressed purpose of limiting the People Republic's development of military and dual-use technologies. Right now in Europe, we are focused on the acute threat posed by Russian aggression on our continent. This is completely correct. But a critical long-term threat is that a systemic rival leaves us behind technologically and thereby positions itself to dominate us. In plain language, countering this threat requires that the open and free societies over time collectively outperform China. This requires that we manage two key things simultaneously. Firstly, that we maximize our own economic growth and secondly, that we manage to cooperate and maintain and develop as much free trade amongst the free world as possible. Only with a sufficiently big collective economic base can we achieve more economic and technological development than our competitors. The critical objective over time must be to ensure the continued economic preeminence of free states. Not because free states should dominate anyone else, but because global economic preeminence of an authoritarian state would allow that state to dominate others, thereby threatening the continued survival of open societies. So, what does that mean right now? We must keep handling Russia and focus on the environmental challenges ahead of us, all whilst preparing for various other crises to manifest along the path into the future. But to win the critical long game, the most important thing is to continue doing what we've been doing well over the past decades, ensuring we maintain our global competitiveness. We mustn't forget the positive side of the story, what we're good at, and keep striving for continued excellence. Sweden is fourth in the 2022 IND Global Competitiveness Ranking. Finland climbed three places to number eight. According to the latest World Bank data of all countries, 
Sweden invested the third highest percentage of its GDP in research and development, and Finland was in place 11. The importance of crisis preparedness cannot be underestimated, but we must never forget our critical backbone upon which everything else is built, our country's long-term competitiveness and our openness towards our friends. Thank you. Thank you so much. So, uh, going to the next speaker, uh, uh, expanding a little bit on the theme, it's Mikael Vigel from the, uh, is the research director at the Finnish uh, Institute of International Affairs, going to talk about the Nordic resilience. A warm welcome, Mikael. Thanks a lot, and uh, thanks indeed for the invitation. And uh, so what I thought of, of doing is really to, to uh, present our uh, report that we produced at the Finnish Institute of International Affairs with, a, with, a, with the research team. Uh, it was financed by the Nordic Council of Ministers, um, and it's called Nordic Resilience, Strengthening Cooperation on Security of Supply and Crisis Preparedness. I'm, I'm happy to note that this concept of Nordic resilience has already been used and mentioned here uh, today several times. Um, I believe it's, it's something that we also gave some thought to that, that this is a concept that, that should be invoked. So um, this report came out uh, a couple of months ago, a month and a half ago, and I, and I encourage you to take a, take a look at it. So we had four project goals when we went into this work. First was to really to map and assess existing Nordic crisis preparedness and security supply models in all the Nordics, that includes self-governing regions. Um, assess uh, any sort of disruptive drivers uh, affecting Nordic crisis preparedness and security of supply, such as a war uh, in Ukraine or a health crisis or, or, or so on and forth, environmental issues. Third, to evaluate the current status and uh, potential for Nordic cooperation within this field of crisis preparedness and security supply. And then to provide recommendations uh, to policymakers, to Nordic policymakers, on ways to strengthen uh, cooperation. In, in, order, in crisis preparedness and security supply. So what we did then was we used basically three research methods. First, we did a very comprehensive review of the literature, of sort of all, went through all the policy documents of research literature across the Nordics. We then went in to make uh, expert interviews with experts across the Nordics. We did all in all 53 interviews with 85 interviewees, and these were no short interviews, they were, they were long, very in-depth interviews, so we have a lots and lots of interview uh, data and material from, from this research project. And lastly, we did a focus group validation with uh, a selected group of experts who sort of validated and tested our research findings and, and, and also gathered views for, for our policy recommendations. So what you have in this report is, I dare to say, the most comprehensive work ever on crisis preparedness and, and secure supply in the Nordics. It presents a, a, a really a comprehensive comparative analysis of these models in the, in the Nordic with a, with a wealth of new empirical data. Um, structure of the report really shortly, introduction of course, and then we had uh, several chapters when we really go in and compare and, and go through all the Nordic models in a, in a different aspects. Threat, how, how do Nordics look at threat perceptions? What are their processes for threat assessments? What, what threats do they, do they uh, assess at the moment? We went into key concepts and definitions underpinning the organization of crisis preparedness and security of supply. What are the terms here? Terminology is really, really different in the Nordic countries, and that's a bit of a problem. That's why we came up with this concept of Nordic resilience, that we should speak in the same, with the same terms here. Uh, in Nordic countries, some use crisis preparedness, others civil preparedness, crisis management, security supply, whatnot. It's difficult to find cooperative uh, and, and, and find one's peer in the other country when we speak in such, with such different terminolo not terminology. So we try to come up with a bit of a, a similar uh, suggestions for similar terminology. Actors and responsibilities. So what we did we was mapping of all the actors and their responsibilities in the different countries, in the different Nordics and the self-governing regions, who is responsible for what uh, in, in this field. We uh, 
scan the vital, how the Nordics look at vital functions of society, how do they define vital functions and what are they in the different countries, and then in public-private dialogue, what sort of processes are there for this public-private dialogue that we know is so important because a lot of our critical infrastructure, critical services are in the hands of private actors. So private actors need to come in and, die and, and, and have a partnership with the public sector in order for us to be really prepared. Uh, how, do they, who, how do they organize it at the Nordic level? And then we looked at all existing collaborative frameworks, the agreements that are, are there already in the Nordics in different aspects of when it pertains to crisis preparedness and security supply, but also EU and NATO. Um, a few key takeaways from this uh, report. It's clear that Nordic corporations needed it. This came across very, very uh, strongly in all our interviews, for instance. Um, the Nordics is one of the most interconnected regions in the world. That also means that um, a crisis in one part of the Nordics will have effects, effects on other parts of the Nordics. So there's clearly a motivation for more uh, cooperation. The second motivation is also that uh, there are complementarities. So Finland might be good at some part of crisis preparedness or security supply. Denmark might be on another level and there are complementarities in uh, cooperating. So there's a lot of sort of asymmetries that can be used for to make to to for to strengthen cooperation see a second a second key takeaway interesting to note is that there actually is already a joint nordic resilience approach even though we speak in very different terms and everybody tells us that oh it's organized so differently in the countries there is very different dif difficult to compare there are essentially very similar traits when one goes behind the rhetoric in the, in the Nordics. So we essentially we find four similar traits. All the Nordics uh, have used a whole of society approach, which means that societal actors in all these the systems in Nordics are very much involved in crisis preparedness and security supply work. The whole of society approach is a definitive trait of all the Nordics. Secondly, whole of government approach. The actors, the responsibilities are deflected to, to a number of different authorities within the, within, the government, within the government in all the Nordics and at different levels of government. This is, very, it is a common trait in all, and this is something that the Nordics appreciate, that there's a whole, of, whole government approach. All hazards approach, we already heard, heard a bit about that. The Nordics have a common view on threats being that we need to deal with a panoply of different risks and threats, all from environmental hazard risks to hybrid threats to cyber risk and, and whatnot. Uh, this is a common trait, again, in the Nordic countries. We use all hazards approaches in our crisis preparedness work. And finally, societal resilience thinking underpins Nordic thinking around these issues very much. Uh, and this is a common trait in all the Nordics. This is something to build on. So there is actually a Nordic resilience approach already there to build on when we go to strengthen cooperation on Nordic level. This is something to, to work from. Then we come with, with, with four uh, bundles of recommendations how to strengthen uh, cooperation um, within the Nordics. First is a Nordic resilience framework agreement. There's a lot of bi and multilateral agreements at the time being, but they do not provide a shared framework for region-wide cooperation, which is why it would be good to have this new Nordic Resilience Framework Agreement that would gather these different uh, existing agreements under one umbrella. It does not mean that it would replace these existing agreements. They, it would gather it gather them under this umbrella, which would possibilitate more strategic planning and uh, the sort of long-term strategic development of Nordic cooperation in, in, a, in a flexible manner. And it would elevate the, this concept of Nordic resilience, that we would start to speak with that concept, which I find important because, as I said, this babel of the different terminology has been a bit of a problem for cooperation. One specific thing when it comes to this also is the Haga cooperation, which should also be placed under this umbrella. At present, the self-governing regions are not part of the Haga cooperation, and we find that it's, 
they should be. We, we see n no major obstacles or reason why the self-governing regions wouldn't be in the Haga framework. It would benefit all, actually. Second bundle of recommendation is that there's a need for shared risk perceptions and foresight. Um, we need, because of we're interconnected, so greatly interconnected at the Nordic level, we, have, we need to have a better shared awareness of the risks and threats. There are often common risks and threats that we face in, in the Nordics. And it would be beneficial for us to cooperate around those risk assessments and, and do some foresight. And of course, the Hanna Holm Initiative is sort of part of, part of that and a, and a very welcome initiative and that, that can probably broaden to Norway perhaps and to even to Denmark or something. But there's a, lot, a number of potential instruments that would shore up this bit as well. We could organize more expert risk workshops, sharing of situational awareness, joint strategic force, foresight reports, um, scenario-based tabletop exercises and the like. Um, we would see that it would be good if this would be extended to the sort of secret level, uh, in fact, and there is a basis for, for that sort of sharing of information. There is the Nordic Security Agreement of 2013 that provides a legal basis for the exchange of classified information as well, and NATO, depending, uh, Finland and Sweden's joining the NATO will, of course, possibilitate this, this further. Our third bundle of recommendations is a the establishment of a Nordic Resilience Fund. And I know this is ambitious, and nobody wants to pay for anything, uh, but sometimes you just need to. Um, this would be instrumental. I mean, there's a lot of, there has been a lot of talk uh, with, within the sort of the framework of the pandemic that there would be need for, for more joint acquisitions, joint production, manufacturing, distribution of critical supplies at the Nordic level. This sort of calls them for a, Nord for a joint Nordic Resilience Fund as well to possibilitate that sort of joint uh, production and, and acquisition and so on and forth. Uh, there are different models one can use when one sets up such a thing. Finland, of course, has its own uh, national, I'm, I'm, coming, I'm coming to the end here, national uh, fund already, and there are other national funds that one can take examples from. Sweden, Norway, and Denmark, I Iceland do not, uh, as far as I know, have sort of strong national funds. It would, of course, be helpful if those countries also would have those funds, uh, and then it could be sort of brought up to the, to the Nordic level. But I, my last, our last uh, bundle of recommendations that we make is, is a recommendation for, for establishing a Nordic resilience public-private network that would focus on, especially on this sort of security supply side of things. As I said, Private entities are hugely important for crisis preparedness and security of supply. We need to strengthen our dialogue, the public dialogue with the public-private dialogue, uh, also at the Nordic level. There is no such thing really at the time being. Uh, we of course have that framework in Finland and, uh, and, and the other Nordics have their framework for organizing the public-private dialogue at the national level. But since this is this interconnected region facing similar threats, we, we should have this dialogue at the regional level as well. So we would sort of recommend establishing that sort of thing. And with that, I'll come to this and have a look at the report. Thanks. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, and now the last short brief from Mr. Thomas Fransson, head of the port in the Nordic region namely the port of Gothenburg, and you are head of security. and going to brief us a little bit about the importance of that port. Thank you. You're welcome. Not head of port of Gothenburg. My CEO would be uh, raising his uh, eyebrows. I'm uh, head of security, as, as uh, I said. Sorry. Uh, I like that picture. I know there's many nice people from Stockholm here, and it's always... <laughs> good to uh, tell them that we are the largest port in Scandinavia and in the north, uh, and that's the case. Uh, many think that uh, it's not like that, but that's the fact. Uh, the port uh, has 40 million tons of goods every year, uh, and uh, we have, if you go down to the different segments, we have 850,000 containers, 600,000 trailers, two million 
the passengers. Uh, uh, we have 300,000 cars, uh, 23 million tons of energy products. Uh, so we are uh, important for Sweden. Uh, but we are also important for Finland. 15% of Finland's energy products comes from the port of Gothenburg. So the interest for other countries in the north also is uh, large to keep the goods hub open. Uh, some say we are the port of Oslo also, but that would uh, to be say too much. Uh, we're not, uh, not the port for Oslo, but the logistic chains goes that way because we have those direct lines. So the logistics companies uh, go by the port of Gothenburg and then the goods goes by railway and the trailers up to Norway. Uh, but it, it depends on who you speak to if we say we're the largest port in uh, uh, to Norway. <laughs> but that's not uh, true. Uh, 22,000 people work in the port or in the vicinity of the port to keep it open. Because you have the port and port facilities, uh, of course, uh, and they are uh, doing what they should. Uh, ship comes in and ship goes out, uh, load and load off. Uh, but uh, you have to have all the logistics, the backland, uh, uh, the different uh, transport uh, segments and so on. So 22,000 people works. Uh, in, in the vicinity of the port. So why is that? Why, why are we so big? Well, it's only to look at the map and the uh, ge geography. Uh, we have uh, we celebrated 400 years, 2020, uh, and uh, we're planning to stay on 400 more years. Uh, we have what the industry wants. We have uh, 50 uh, direct lines, whoops, uh, direct lines uh, that goes directly to Gothenburg. We have the large uh, vessels, 20,000 container vessels coming in. Uh, and that's what the industry wants because uh, they want short uh, lead of uh, their logistics and that's a good business case. So that's why they choose us. Uh, but uh, of course, we also have uh, feeder traffic uh, going uh, into the Baltic. Uh, and the way it looks right now, the largest uh, shipping companies, we are the end of uh, uh, where they go from Asia and around. So we are the last port. Uh, and uh, when you talk about the Northeast uh, Passage in the future, we are now investing in uh, uh, increase our depth so we can take if they turn around, so they go the other way. We, we get to, to be the first port, so we have uh, the depths uh, even for that. But then the question comes, uh, how do we provide uh, Sweden and uh, others with all those supplies? And COVID is a good example. We had uh, uh, many questions that can be, you have to tell us when the medical supplies arrives and uh, how, why don't you uh, make a priority for that and so on. Uh, but you have to understand, a vessel with 20,000 containers consists of uh, medication, uh, uh, medical supplies, food, weapons, toys, all, the, all things. And we don't know what's in the containers. The harbor doesn't know. The terminal doesn't know. The Swedish custom knows. But how could you prioritize one ship for the other? So it's only one way to do this, and that is to keep the port open. Uh, and that's difficult, uh, and uh, uh, of course you have to work with all those uh, legislation and certif certificates that uh, uh, we have to apply to. You have the ISPS code, that's for the port facilities. Uh, uh, you have the uh, EU Directive 65, 2005, the uh, harbor protection. Uh, we have the Swedish legislation, Schutzlagen, a protection law. Uh, you have Säkerhets Schutzlagen, also a, a special uh, pr protection uh, uh, law. Uh, and that's a lot. Uh, we have the port security organization is needed to keep the port open for the different threats. And it can be many threats. Terrorism, uh, like we have now, we have an increased security in the harbor. 
because uh, things happen. We have donors. Uh, we have people on different places, cars. Uh, so we have a lot of information rolling uh, and going to the uh, secret police. Um, but what we have done, uh, we have connected all those different certificates and laws. It's like a spider web. Uh, you build it, and uh, they have to comply with each other. Otherwise, it, it, we can't work uh, uh, to different ISPs there and the harbor protection there. And that's what we've done. So the, in the port, uh, we have a security central. We have K9 24-7. Three teams, 24-7, five minutes alert. Uh, we have uh, a reserve uh, security central that can be up running in five minutes uh, and do exact the same as the original. Um, we have the latest you know, seven, eight months worked with um, um, plans uh, to, to create uh, war organizations, clicks organizational. Uh, and actually, we have done that. The Port Authority and Port of Gothenburg have all personal needed placed, uh, it's called clicks placering, I don't know the English word, but they are placed uh, and have to be according to law when we go up to le that level, when, I hope not, but if. We have also, and that's un unique in Sweden, we have all terminals, even if they are Danish who, who manage them, all the personnel there are also placed and have a war organization and we have an agreement with them. And now we go the last step. We go, because it doesn't help that just the port facilities has this. Uh, you have train operators, you have all the other par parts that we need to keep the port open. And we have to take that step now, so I'm happy to say we have, I won't say which or who, we have two uh, important companies now that we have uh, agreements to create war organization and place people. Uh, uh, so uh, we have come a far way. And even this, the war organization and the plans we have for that has to be a part of the other uh, laws and uh, certificates. How should we work otherwise? Uh, today we have like 500 uh, side, sides uh, of plans lying there, ready to go. And we have no uh, comply them with the war uh, planning for, for those uh, higher level and threat levels. Uh, and we have a lot of uh, cooperation, of course. Maritime Security Committee is one where all authorities uh, in Sweden uh, that has something to do with harbors and logistics are participants of. Well, I end with the words that I always say, security is good for business. Thank you so much. Thank you. So the port of Gothenburg, almost present in all crisis scenarios that we work with. Um, uh, so it's uh, now we're starting to come to the end. So we have yet another panel with participants from the program uh, that's going to uh, give you all a little bit of a flavor, what they have experienced, what they have learned, and maybe some ideas to all of us. So I would like to welcome on stage uh, Johan Bellfrage, director at Saab. Katarina Kandolin, cyber expert at the OPA Group, also with a background from the military. Uh, Paulina Escola, uh, Director of International Relations, the Ministry of Interior. And Johan Knigge, uh, Director at the Swedish Red Cross. And here you also can see that uh, the participants in the Hanholm Initiative come from all sectors from the private sector, from the NGO, from authorities such as MSB, and everything in between. And that's, of course, important because everybody has to be involved in solving a crisis. So um, a little bit like a scope for this panel now is to conclude a little bit what, we have, uh, what you have experienced throughout this day, listening to all the speakers, your colleague in the panel, and the Minister of Civil Defense, and many more. So uh, maybe starting with you, Katarina, and reflection. What's your f reflections from today? 
Well, I think that one thing that this day has showed as mm. Well, as the course is that we have taken a very comprehensive approach, and as you say, we have mm. had from very a lot of sectors. Mm. So we have had from the military, we have had from the civilian side, we have had both the authorities and we have had the private sector, etc. And also during the course, one of the things that we did was that we worked a lot with concrete scenarios, and mm. we were hosted by a lot of organizations. Yes. We had NESA that mm. provided us a very good program. Mm. We had a hybrid center of excellence mm. that also shows collaboration not only between the Nordics, but also between the rest of <coughs> Europe. Mm. In Sweden, we had MSB giving mm. us value. We had Lenstyrelsen, and also the Swedish police. And of mm. course, we were hosted by the National Defense University, mm. which brings in a little bit of military flavor. Yeah. So I think mm. that having this broad view that we have seen both today here at the mm. seminar, but mm. also during the course, really reflects what this has been all about. Mm. Interesting. And uh, you won, sitting here listening analyzing what's your take-home message so far no but it's been uh, i very much agree with what you say i think this has been a really amazing journey being mm. part of this program and being part of today it's like mm. uh, being the program on steroids mm. and it's been very 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 nice uh, hearing a lot of the the presentations today and and uh, both was uh, carl and michael was saying was really sweet music to my ears mm. involving the private sector more together with the public sector, mm -hmm. but also this whole um, uh, resilience region of, of uh, the whole Nordic mm -hmm. getting that together. And, and uh, I heard that was uh, mentioned as well, mm -hmm. hopefully adding that uh, for the coming years, maybe mm -hmm. our brothers and sisters from the other countries mm -hmm. would be very nice. And going to Paulina, what would you like to spin on from today? Well, today, um, many things have been uh, said uh, many times, mm -hmm. like the Nordic uh, resilient region. Yes. Um, in, um, in the Finnish, um, uh, in the report presentation, mm. it was mentioned that uh, there could be an umbrella agreement. Uh, mm. That was something, uh, a new idea mm. Mm. Uh, that we really haven't touched upon during the course mm. Mm. Uh, and the funding as well. That was mm. uh, a new angle. Mm. Um, but uh, the other things we have uh, touched upon during mm. the course, mm. um, also the protection of critical infrastructure, very mm. important issue these days, um, yes. and also public-private uh, partnership mm. that has been repeated many times. Mm. And uh, I'd like to highlight one important thing which we've been discussing in different groups uh, mm. during our program, is that uh, it's really essential to know whom to contact. Yes. Whether it's uh, in your own country, mm. in different organizations, mm. whether it's in uh, authorities or uh, third sector or private sector, mm. or whether it's in the neighboring country, mm. Sweden. Mm. And then you are. Yeah, I'm, I'm still offended that we didn't have a music when we came up on the, <laughs> on the, on the, on the, on the, on the stage, so I, I tried to... You have to so high expectations. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yes, I start actually uh, uh, last, last night when I went to bed here in one of the beautiful rooms at uh, Hannaholmen. There were three books, and the one on the top the name was Nerd och Lust, Sverige och Finland i samtid och framtid. So Sweden uh, today and in the future. Mm. Mm. And in the first page, it said there is a profoundly difference between living side by side or existing together. Yes. And I think that the course and even today is a great example of existing together. I think mm. that uh, we coming from different branches, but mm. from two countries. And I never felt that the two countries separated us. No. It was more about what experience do you have, mm. uh, um, what do you bring to the table, the mm. discussions we had, and I think this was uh, really a, a great experience from that point of view. Mm. That was more about really con getting to the concrete examples, mm. trying to figure out what are the problems, what are the challenges, and mm. not too much emphasis on, on, on even, of course, uh, trying to understand the differences in the mm. system. Mm. Uh, but we never ended up in being like the Swedes and the, and the Finns on, on, on one side or on the other. It was really coming together. Uh, thank you, Johan. And Johan, uh, we have presented in the in the in the first panel, you know, the overall themes uh, th that you you have identified as extra important, and underneath that, a lot of action. And then we talked about the personal action and uh, how. What what was your personal actions? Yeah, my personal actions. Uh, uh, but I, if I can start a little bit with the overall themes, yes, be, please. because I, I think that's um, um, important. Uh, uh, I think our minister pointed out earlier today that mm. what what's in the center. 
what what are we, what is in the center of the of the system? It's a citizen, mm. uh, and for us, of course, as as, uh, um, as the Red Cross and Red Crescent, what's this, what's the what's the goal? What are we actually protecting? Of course, it's the the life of people of humans. Mm. Mm. So, what's in the center of it is the humans, and I think this mm. is also something that we had in the course. The Mikael, our representing Swedish police, was always coming back to what is the core of everything. Mm. And Carl, you were mentioning what is the the, the core the, the core of of, of uh, the, the free open society, and I think mm. to have the human in the center of, of uh, everything that we are talking about is so important that we don't forget it when we talk about systems and structures. Yes. Mm. Uh, and humans have different abilities. Mm. Uh, that's also important. So not mm. only that humans are in, this, in, in, in the center, but also that we really take in the human perspective when we are planning. Mm. Who's not around the table when, mm. we're, when we're planning? So I think this is something that's important that it's really going through the whole work that we don't forget about humans in different... Um. Mm. But of course, I have to also now tell what I had on my list. Yes, uh, good. Uh, uh, because I think this was really really good to have yep. this very concrete. What are you doing when you come back yes. And there are some more easy ones when I go back to home. Of course, I'm, I'm very happy that the international humanitarian law is now higher up on the agenda again. I think this is something where the Red Cross, of course, has a mandate, has a role to play. And I think this is actually a strength that Finland and Sweden has. We have a historical strong role when it comes to international humanitarian law. And I think this is something we could think about when we go into NATO together. And I think here the Nordic Red Cross movements have a strong role to play together with the states. So this is something I will try to, to take back home so that we don't do it uh, separately in, in, our, in our countries. And the other thing that I was uh, thinking about when we, we had all these nice maps here, our countries are long and uh, we have a countryside, rural areas, and I think there are some challenges. Uh, so so uh, Mikael representing the Northern Police District and uh, Marco representing a region in, in, in Finland, I think we should... Uh, in some way initiate uh, more activities around how, what does civil preparedness, what does crisis preparedness mean in rural areas. I think there's uh, a lot of challenges that we have to, to address and, and uh, I think we could do this together. Mm -hmm. So this was something I... Uh, very good. Um, uh, turning to, to Johan, I mean, uh, you are an entrepreneur, when the other Johan, I would say. Uh, you are an entrepreneur uh, at heart. Uh, we have witnessed that during the course, and you, you, you have a burning passion for the public-private. And you have a passion for flexible preparedness. Uh, and that we have discussed today, and also a lot in the program. Can you just uh, take us, what is it, and what have you, what's your experience from the area? Sure, and it was very nice to see that in, in Mikkel's presentation as well. Uh, well, for us, we, we came up with a concept called, that we named uh, flexible preparedness, which is basically utilizing flexible production, mm. um, where we found out basically the experience from, from, from the pandemic. We see that Sweden and I would say the Nordic have an extremely strong industry base for being so small countries, uh, which we feel uh, that we are not really utilizing in a fully effective way, that we can use already existing infrastructure for flexible production, that we can cluster companies together um, to and basically produce what is needed when it's needed. So we see it as a little bit of a complement to more traditional uh, sort of crisis preparedness tools such as um, stockpiling, etc. cetera. Um, and this came up when, when we tried to solve, help solve together with uh, other companies the, the urgent need for uh, personal protective equipment for the healthcare sector. And then we very quickly realized that, that uh, I mean, the, the system is very sub-optimized. We haven't structured this. So if we can structure it and contribute with our respective sort of strong points, for example, ABB, world leader in automation, uh, solve. We have pretty good uh, and high-tech production uh, areas. Volvo with logistics, uh, Mönlücke with, with uh, <coughs> really good knowledge in, in the healthcare uh, system but no production in Sweden, for example. Research institutes of Sweden that can certify um, products very quickly. And, and region Stockholm, for example, this was the, the use case that we used for, for how can we be better next time we have a crisis in the, in the healthcare sector. And then we saw that we can scale this to basically all sectors. Um, so that was the, the, the whole idea where we feel it's probably fairly cost effective and um, a complement to, to what we already have. And, and Katarina, coming from the cyber domain, uh, if you combine uh, what Johan is talking about, uh, you're the public, private, and then combine it with exercises, do you think it's uh, that we have potential to 
cooperate more with exercises in the civil defense domain between Sweden and Finland? Uh, I actually believe that there's a huge potential for exercises and uh, I don't even think that we have to start from scratch because we already have exercises and funnily enough we just had uh, one of the largest civil preparedness exercises in Finland, Tieto, and now for the first time we had actually Sweden as an observer. So my thought was that, okay, we have been talking about exercises and the need to do things together here at Hanna Holmen. They are already inviting Sweden. Why don't we join forces and see if we could use this as a low-hanging fruit to quickly do something together rather than starting from scratch and start to plan. This is, of course, a large exercise. All exercises don't have to be large. We can also do smaller tabletops. We could use the green button uh, thing we learned from Lens Dürelsen in Stockholm to really quickly get around some concrete scenario, etc. So we have actually a lot of possibility. We shouldn't make it too complicated. Mm. Interesting. We talked a lot about that. And Turning to Paulina, uh, I heard that you work a little bit with NATO and uh, prepared it. Well, what, what has been the discussion in the, in the program regarding NATO's uh, resilience work and seven baseline requirements for us two countries co hopefully coming in into NATO now? Yes, we've discussed uh, NATO's uh, seven baseline requirements, mm. as, uh, as we heard uh, Gay Arne presenting us, and uh, especially during our our uh, course time in, in Stockholm, we had uh, several discussions over NATO's baseline requirements. And uh, also from the perspective, um, what can uh, we two countries uh, bring to NATO regarding resilience? Uh, are we resilient enough? Uh, are our societies resilient? About a comprehensive security model, which we have, uh, which was already mentioned here several times today. And uh, what can uh, we get from uh, NATO and from other allies uh, when, when we get to um, full members? Mm. And um, I think that uh, the comprehensive security model is uh, definitely something uh, worth uh, taking forward as, uh, as a Nordic model, for example, as, as well. And um, not only Finnish Swedish, but also a Nordic, um, as the report uh, just presented, uh, mentioned that this is something that we have in common in, in all the Nordic countries. And also um, the close connection to EU, NATO resilience work, that's something uh, quite important because, uh, as mentioned today, um, NATO doesn't have the binding legislation. Um, EU does, and uh, there is one difference uh, in, in these two frameworks, but uh, definitely something societal resilience, um, um, this is something, and a comprehensive secu security model, and um, I mean, resilience begins from each and every one citizen, uh, from the um, public-private uh, cooperation, etc. So I think there's a lot to, to uh, take forward also in the NATO context. Do Sweden and Finland have a joint strategy, how, uh, what they can offer NATO and what NATO can offer us? Hmm. Good question. Not to my knowledge. <laughs> Should we have that? Um, maybe uh, I would put it in a larger context, uh, speaking about uh, maybe the Nordic model and, and also um, not to form... Um, Blocks in yeah, a Iran, way. they warned us. Uh, yes. Don't form a block. Yeah. NATO don't like blocks. Yeah, uh, not not forming blocks, but mm -hmm. to um, take uh, or take forward the the good uh, or the best practices, good practices that we have, and some ideas, some models that we have, uh, and also um, seeing what the other countries can offer something, uh, or the NATO can, if if the NATO can offer something that we don't have, or what we should take into account. Like vice versa. Katarina? Yeah, I actually like the comment. I have heard this Nordic block as a scary thought, and I think that we need to change the narrative and have a common narrative. So, not talking about a block, no. We are a bunch of nations that have tradition of working together for years, despite differences in the way we are doing things and despite the way that we are thinking. This is an asset to NATO, and I think we have to have this narrative rather than talk about the Nordic bloc. Very good. Almost, an, yeah, yeah. I, I, I could feel it was worth an applause. So. Um, <laughs> 
we also we have a we almost feel like we have started the movement towards more cooperation uh, in, in, in civil preparedness or civil defense or call it resilience. Um, and yesterday, uh, somebody of you said uh, during the workshop that uh, it's important with a political will. I think uh, uh, Reiner put forward that uh, 10, 15 years ago, it was a very strong political will to have a close cooperation in the military domain between Sweden and Finland. And then someone, you said, it's a political will, there's a practical way. But what about if we don't see that clear political will? What do we do then? You want? No, but I, I think, of course, it helps if there is a will. I think you put it very well. But I think uh, it was mentioned here previously. I think if we continue digging and taking small steps, then we will fi find the ways around and by joining forces and aligning ourselves, I, I think if you see obstacles, you will, you will stumble into them. If you see opportunity, you will manage to go around the ob obstacle and, and, um, and find the solution. So I, I think uh, small steps forward all the time mm -hmm. while we're sort of doing the bigger picture at the same time. And uh, you won. Uh, I know you've been thinking a little bit about the alumni network. How could we utilize that? How can others utilize that? But now we have around 50 experts working with crisis preparedness. Yes, I think that connects a little bit to the, to the question before. Because I, 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 I think that um, what we also learned uh, today, uh, I think the Secretary of State said, uh, don't let the war uh, shadow other crises. And I think um, this is also something that we have to take to into account when, when we work with this, that we can't focus on, on only war or only uh, the climate uh, challenge or only. So, so, so we have to be uh, here much more um, agile and also st starting and testing things. Um, pilotering, as you say so nicely in uh, Finland, I learned. Uh, and I think here Hanna Holmen could be, could be a catalyst for this. Um, because I think when we come here, um, we come from our daily uh, businesses with all our daily uh, problems, challenges, and we have had these challenges maybe for years. And of course, six days in the Hanna Holmen programs will not solve all these problems, unfortunately. But I think there is a lot of energy in the, in the group, and there is uh, not only energy, I think there's also a big will to actually take s uh, steps uh, forward. And I think what would be very uh, nice and, and I think very strong if the alumni network would have a strength uh, to take these pilots or IDs further. And I don't think it needs too much, but it needs something more so that when we go back and have all our daily challenges, we know there is like a structure. So if we want to start something or test something, then there's somebody who can host it. We are willing to, to put in uh, both uh, time and also uh, uh, some money, but we need a structure to, to just uh, hook on it. And I think this is something that Hannah Holman really could uh, be a catalyst for, to, to take ideas further, because I think that's the small steps we need. Uh, otherwise, we will drown in the, in the big challenges uh, that we have in our daily, daily operations. Great idea, Johanna. I think we, we should um, wrap up by asking a question to the audience again. You know, we had six themes this year. It was the understanding of our respective systems. Uh, we have the uh, security of supply. We have the hybrid. We have the planning and leadership, uh, working with the county administrative board in, Stock in, in, in Stockholm. Uh, we had the, the police. And we also had uh, uh, will to defend. But the question to the audience, what should the Hon Holman Initiative focus on next year? What themes should we focus on next year in order to be accurate and create value and support? Uh, so what uh, themes should the Holm Initiative look at? Now we can turn around and see what's happening. Already some ideas, some trilateral there. Maybe Gerane and, uh, and his friend from Norway will join. Uh, communicate, uh, communication we talked quite a lot about, especially in the will to defend with uh, uh, Stratcom, strategic communication, practical work, like Petri put it, should be action also, uh, and maybe a little less conversation and more action. Um, involve youth, well, that's a great idea as well, uh, especially when it comes to will to defend. Do you see anything you want that you find extra interesting here? No, but of course, the NATO, it's pretty big there. And, and, uh, <laughs> 
<laughs> of course, I think that it would be very interesting uh, doing study visits to, to the NATO headquarters, for example. Yes, I think that would be nice. Is. And then we have the Arctic, you have creating results. And then you need to define what is results from a program such as this. Is it that Sweden now have a minister for civil defense? Is that the result? Uh, or is it something else? Uh, the third directives, doing that together. Thank you for, for contributing. We will uh, have this as a, as a foundation for, for the planning. Um, so thank you all for joining this panel. And uh, thank you for contributing uh, to this.